My talk's going to be just a little bit different. My talk's going to be centered more on keeping you injury free rather than dealing with an injury. Um, so first, to do that, you have to talk about how to come up with an injury prevention strategy. And the first part of that is identifying first the incidence of an injury that happens to a particular athlete doing a particular sport. Let me uh, identify the risk factors uh, for that injury, followed by trying to design interventions that lower the uh, risk uh, of sustaining that injury. And then you can also test the, the intervention as well. So for this talk, I'm going to uh, focus on injuries that are considered preventable. Not all injuries are obviously preventable. Uh, and then we're going to specifically talk about alpine skiing, snowboarding, and, and ice hockey. So we're going to first start with uh, alpine skiing. Right, And uh, as we see, uh, most injuries to skiers are to the lower extremities, right? with about 35% of those being to the knee. If you look into that a little bit further, we see about 50% of knee injuries in skiers are injuries to the ACL specifically. Upper extremity injuries are much more rare to skiers, with the most common being uh, something called game keep, gamekeeper's thumb or skier's thumb. It's injury to the ulnar collateral ligament of the thumb based on using your palm. Okay, so the injury uh, risk for ACL uh, in skiers, also MCL injuries as well, uh, has been studied in the past. The first study that came out a little while ago was on recreational skiers, and they identified two mechanisms. Uh, those were landing, <coughs> and when a skier does that, um, a recreational skier, when they're falling, landing back weighted, there's two effects that are thought to create high levels of ACL strain, and that's one thing called the boot-induced anterior drawer. Uh, and also the east, an eccentric quad contraction. So when you land on your ski tails, the forces from the boot are transferred to the knee, creating a higher shear force. <coughs> Another thing is called a phantom foot. Uh, what this is is when the skier is falling backwards, uh, the outside edge, uh, I'm sorry, the inside edge of the downhill ski will catch the snow, and the Foot, uh, knee is forced into internal rotation based on a, a phantom foot phenomenon. So if we look, uh, there's another study done on ski racers specifically, and they identified three mechanisms in this population. One of them is called the slip catch mechanism, which we're going to talk about a little bit further. That happens in about 50% of ski ACL-related injuries in this population. Uh, they also identify the landing back weighted and something called a dynamic snow plow where the uphill ski actually catches the inside edge, kind of forcing the person into an internal location in the knee as well. Very mimics basically uh, when you're doing a snow plow down, down the slope. So if we look at that slip catch mechanism, the reason I wanted to look at that one is that it's not during a fall necessarily. The skier is unbalanced when turning, however. So as we can see in this picture B here, uh, the skier gets off balance. The outside leg comes off the snow. They try to reach to put that outside ski back on the snow. And their knee is extended. And so when they hit that inside edge on the snow, the, the ski abruptly catches the snow and forces the knee into that internal rotation position. As so we look at that a little bit further here, with the advent of the uh, parabolic skis, when that outside edge hits the snow, it automatically wants to turn. It does make a easier, easier turning mechanism, but it also creates this increased internal rotation and valgus loading of the knee. Uh, and that creates high levels of uh, force to the ACL of the, of the skier. So with those risks, we want to now design interventions to help lower your risk of sustaining that injury. And everything is really centered around control of this internal rotation and valgus loading of your knee. So there's many different ways to exercise to work in this direction. One of the ones that has been most uh, efficacious is balanced and proprioceptive exercise. Right? So doing things that put you in a ski-specific position on an unbalanced surface. Uh, and also, one thing that should be added is, is perturbations. And that could be through a partner. Uh, that could be through um, um, tossing a ball uh, or anything that creates an outside force where you have to adjust to it. 
We also have strength training, which is a very important uh, tool because skiing requires high levels of strength to control those forces, to control your turn. Uh, we, don't, we want to stress also trunk control. So obviously, most of these injuries happen when you're off balance or uh, losing control. So if you can help correct that, a lot of times you can correct uh, injuries downstream. And then the last one is plyometric or jump training. Right? This has shown a lot of um, improvement in risk levels of people sustaining non-contact ACL injuries, especially in uh, sports like soccer, uh, skiing, things like that, where there's no one hitting you. And one thing I want to stress is that the landing technique is the most important. It's not how high you jump or how far you jump. It's how you land. So if you land very softly, don't hit the ground very hard, and you control that internal rotation of your knee, uh, you're lowering your risk of in sustaining that injury. So then we're going to switch gears. We're going to uh, head over to snowboarding. And one thing we see when we study the incidence of injuries in snowboarders, we see a significantly larger amount of upper extremity injuries than lower extremity injuries in the recreational skier. In competitive, professional snowboarders, we see actually more knee injuries, less wrist injuries, because they fall a little bit less. The uh, second most common injury to a snowboarder is a shoulder injury, a soft tissue shoulder injury, with rotator cuff strains being the most common one. And the mechanisms that have been proposed for snowboarders and shoulder injuries, in, in, you know, more specifically, are falls on outstretched arms, uh, collisions, and as well as an eccentric load uh, to the shoulder as the border resists abduction. So basically, the, the border is off balance or falling and tries to catch themselves and control the rate of descent, creating a large uh, load to a smaller muscle group in the shoulder that's not strong enough to withstand that load. So prevention of rotator cuff strains, we want to really focus on the smaller muscles of the shoulder, uh, mostly the external and internal rotators. So with snowboarding, there's high velocities and high impact forces. Most of the falls are taken to the upper extremities. So there's a need for a high level of strength and endurance in this group. One thing I want to stress, though, is when you are exercising this muscle group, only about 40% of maximal contraction is needed to really get the right activation. All right. So that thing, think of that as there's lower, repetition, uh, lower resistance with higher repetitions. You bring the load up very high for things like internal and external rotation. Uh, you're going to get the bigger muscles that are going to be activated. They're going to compensate. And the, the smaller ones that we're trying to strength train to decrease the risk are going to be uh, used, used a little less. When talking about the shoulder, we always have to kind of add in the uh, scapular aspect of this. Uh, research has shown that isolated fatigue of the scapular musculature has uh, led to alterations in the shoulder motion, which therefore increases your injury risk. These are some of the muscles of the uh, scapular musculature. Uh, not all of them, but they're considered the finer points. So the exercises you want to do for scapular training specifically are rowing type exercises, prone exercises, horizontal abduction where you bring your arm out to the side, things that really engage uh, the muscles around your uh, shoulder blade. So we're going to switch to uh, ice hockey now. Uh, and when we study this population, we see that most of their injuries are actually sustained at the end of games. Actually, one thing I've found through doing a little bit of research is this is actually a relatively low injury risk sport, which I think most of us wouldn't suspect. They actually have a lower risk of injuries or lower amounts of injuries than soccer. Um, so when we look at this group, we see obviously the most injuries are contusions or bruises, uh, which is pretty consistent with the type of sport they play. And the second most would be sprains or strains. And we're going to focus mostly on those adductor muscle strains. So that's the inside muscle of your thigh. Uh, it's the second most common injury in, in hockey, ranging anywhere from 17 to 40% of all hockey injuries. So a landmark study for hockey players was in 2001 by this group um, out of uh, Nismat, New York City. Uh, they found that there was a large association between hip adduction strength and adductor strains. They found that you are 17 times more likely to sustain an adductor strain if your adductor strength is less than 80% of your abductor strength. And so up at the top there, the person's testing the adductor strength. That's this muscle group right here. And then in the bottom here, they're testing your adductor strength. That's this muscle group right here, to be able to bring the, the leg up. 
So the arrow is just the, the force of the person, but the, uh, the, the person's laying on the other side. So this thigh, this is the right thigh, and this is the left. So normally, uh, people that don't uh, get adductor strains, their strength ratio is about 95%. So there's a significant reduction in the strength. So they followed that study up with the second study the next year, and they tried to come up with an injury prevention program for this group, focused specifically on targeting that risk factor, so strengthening those adductors. So they used all of these exercises for this group, and it was a professional hockey team, so they had quite a few resources. But I'm going to just show you a few that I thought were the most uh, indicative of uh, preventing injury. So the first one here would be things like side lunges, right? So you're working both the concentric and eccentric phase of the muscle contraction in a lengthening state in this, this exercise here. This is another uh, good one, easy one to do anywhere basically, or basically adduction against resistance. And it can be elastic, it can be a cable column. You can do it on your side with a weight. You can do it on your on a bed with a pocketbook. It can be done anywhere. Uh, the last one here, it is a little more advanced, but it's great for hockey specifically. It's um, something called a, a slider. You're basically sliding out to the side, right? This is the starting position, sliding out to the side, and then sliding back. So the person's foot is on something called a valley slide, but you can really use a paper plate on a carpet or anything like that. Uh, a furniture mover works just as fine too. But the key is that this is very similar to the hockey motion, or the skating motion, not hockey motion. Uh, the adductor muscle group is this group right here, and it controls the rate of adduction when you're stable. So they did this study uh, after uh, this team had indicated that they had a lot of adductor strain. So prior to implementing this exercise protocol, they had 11 adductor strains the season before. And then after it, uh, implementing this protocol, they only had three. So the incidence dropped from 8 to 2% uh, per season for, for a professional hockey team, which if you think of how many games lost, practices lost, that's, that's quite a few. So the last thing I'm gonna show you is, if you don't even play those sports, that's fine. We're gonna talk about this study. This is a uh, very large meta-analysis, uh, reviewed all injury prevention studies and sports injuries specifically, and they found that Stretching offered very little to no pr protective effect, which is pretty uh, commonly found in the literature. Uh, proprioceptive training, which offered a moderate effect towards risk reduction, and strength training uh, offered a significant effect towards risk reduction. And their biggest take-home point was that strength training reduced uh, sports-related injuries to less than one-third. Uh, and these are all the references I have. Everybody wants those, you can uh, just give, uh, give Molly and send those out. Thank you.